Thank you. May I request everyone to settle down so that we can start with our much awaited annual G20 address. Good evening, everyone. So we moved on to our much awaited annual G20 address, which is on the new protectionism. To chair this session, we have Montek Singh Aluwalia, who's the former deputy chairman of the Planning Commission, Government of India. And as you all know, the address will be delivered by none other than Richard Baldwin, professor of international economics, the Graduate Institute, Geneva. Over to Mr. Aluwalia. Well, thank you very much and good evening, everybody. Uh, I have a very pleasant task of uh, taking a few minutes uh, to introduce uh, Professor Richard Baldwin, who's actually known to all of you. So I'm just going to make two points here. One is that his most recent book, The Globotics Upheaval, has been described by Larry Summers as the best book on the subject. So you can't get a better endorsement than that from someone who's been at the center of policy making. Uh, and I've seen uh, the PowerPoint presentation that he's going to make, and I can promise you that you're in for a, both a very instructive and also a very enjoyable time. It's not full of all kinds of equations, but in case some of you want, I'm sure he can trot them out at the drop of a hat. But you know, I have asked him to add in a little bit more. Since the book, the, the presentation tells you about what Globotics is going to do to the new, the new process of either destroying or offshoring or reshoring jobs, and that's a very interesting story, but I've asked him to focus a little bit on implications for countries like India. I mean, we were huge beneficiaries of the offshoring of certain jobs in the service area in the first revolution. Uh, now, what you're going to get is a transformation which will possibly destroy some jobs uh, in industrialized countries and replace them with, with roboticized functions. Uh, it'll end the reshore, it'll bring some jobs will get reshored, but the, presumably some jobs will get offshored. And the question really is that if India wants to benefit from the global sharing in labor services, uh, what are the things currently going on which are most important for that purpose. And what I said to him was that there's a lot of discussion currently going on uh, on issues of uh, uh, the internet and the splinter net and the free movement of data and wha whatnot, all of which one reads about in newspapers. Uh, and I don't think people fully understand it, at least I don't. And I'm kind of trying to get a grip on what do those discussions imply for the likely prospect of being able to share in the new jobs that are going to be created. So he's very kindly agreed to sort of weave that story in into the presentation that he's going to make. So with those words, uh, Richard, great to see you again. He was, he was there, he reminded me, on the very first such session after the ICRIA, first ICRIA meeting on the G20. So we both met. We were a lot younger on that occasion. Uh, 
so it's nice to see you again. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. You want to you wanna go there or sit from wherever I, you like? I'm going to start here and then start walking around. Okay, that's okay. Perfect, perfect, um, perfect. Sort of moving target so you don't know where I am. So f first of all, let, let me say uh, thank you for those kind words of introduction. Um, and I want to, to thank ICREA for giving me this great opportunity to share my ideas with you all, uh, I find this a very important audience, and it's an audience that I have yet to reach, I think, with talking, which is uh, the emerging markets. I've given this versions of this talk uh, in the northern part of the world and in Japan, but, but not here, so I'm really looking forward to your feedback and, and exactly the kind of uh, questions that force me to think about what it means for our, uh, other groups of people. I'm, I'm looking forward very much to that. And I'd also like to thank, in particular, Anirud Shingal, who uh, I was no, knew in Switzerland at the World Trade in Institute, who's the one who facilitated me coming here. So um, that was great. Also, I understand that I have some competition for tonight. And so it's OK if you guys check on your phone to see who your minister is. I'm, I'm OK with that. Um, I was at the Commerce Department this afternoon, and I, was, I felt pretty proud that they only, like every three minutes, checked their phone to see who was going to be the new Minister of Commerce. Um, now, what I'm going to do, uh, I, let me just say, I want this to be a lively thing, and I'm glad that you're already laughing, because th this is not a laughing matter, but you know, I don't think we have to take uh, deep insights and changes like it, like it was a funeral or something. So uh, I want it to be lively and, 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 get, and get into it. Now, I'm going to do this in two parts. First of all is a standard approach to the new protectionism, and then something that's radically out of the box, which is, uh, which is what uh, the chair was speaking about. So let's start with uh, you know, the topic of conversation and dinners all around the world, Trump and trade. Um, <laughs> Now, <clears throat> what I want to do is make a couple of points. I don't have a great big narrative to weave it in and make big predictions. Um, but I, I have, in the conversations I've had all around the world, gathered a few little snippets which I want to share with you, which may help you in your next dinner table conversation about Trump. So um, the first thing is uh, I want to, as part of the, the, the outcome of this first part, is I want to debunk the anti-globalization narrative as a global thing. I, I think that's overplayed. Um, so the, the first sort of snippet I, is Trump is a false medicine to a very real disease. And you know, if, if you're dyslexic like me a little bit, you look at every word as its parts, and disease is actually dis-ease. <laughs> and that's what we're in, in the world. For some places, it's a real disease, but for many people, it's a dis-ease. And that's for real. Uh, and Trump is not the solution to it, Brexit even less. It's like treating brain cancer with aspirin. You know, you may feel a little better, but in a couple years, you're gonna realize that nothing has changed. And I think, well, hopefully, soon enough, that realization will come to the people who have been left behind in America, and, and it won't be continued. But, um, but let me not get political here. Um, the second thing is that this dis-ease is observed very strongly in the North, where the last 25 years of globalization and automation have been incredibly disruptive to a segment of society which was hard to slot back into the rest of society. But it's led to dis-ease all around the world, including in the winning countries, so to speak, India, China, Vietnam, Thailand, wherever you go, it has led to dis-ease. And I have two kind of quotes or snippets which I think help put that into context. The first thing is that the universal truth or the hard reality of globalization is that globalization provides more opportunities for a nation's most competitive citizens and its most competitive firms. But it provides more competition to its least competitive citizens and its least competitive firms. That's the point. That's the whole thing of comparative advantage. 
Or as Pascal Lamy said the same thing, but more eloquently, he said, Globaliza globalization is painful because it works. And it works because it's painful. In other words, you're shifting people and resources out of the sectors in which you are not world class and into sectors in which you are. And that change is painful. Now, globalization has been ripping along the last 25 years, so whether you were on the winning side, the most competitive, or on the losing side, the least competitive, it was a lot of change, and that's led to dis-ease all around the world. Now, <coughs> the reactions have been national, not international. But journalists all around the world have sought to weave these independent national reactions into a narrative of anti-globalism. For whatever reason, it's laziness or it's easy, it sells newspapers, it reminds us of the 1920s, it sparks our fear so we, we pay attention. But this narrative of anti-globalization needs a lot more nuance. So now what I'm gonna do is go through a couple examples of this. Let me start in Europe. And the main point here is anti-immigration is not anti-globalization. Those are two different things. Just to give you an example, if the world flows of migration ended tomorrow, it would be a darn shame and cause a lot of human suffering, but the economy would not collapse. If tomorrow every flow of goods across the border stop, the economy would collapse tomorrow. That's it. So these are not on the same level of concern. And what we've seen in Europe is a conflation of the anti-immigration, which has been very important in some countries, and anti-trade, which has been important in a few places in a few countries. So in, uh, especially in 2015, there was a huge immigration shock in Europe from the Syrian crisis, and that didn't go everywhere, and the EU was involved in reallocating the refugees according to policies that had already been agreed in principle. But then once they were implemented, countries reacted to it. So the immigration shock led to a certain anti-EU feeling in many countries, especially the countries who did not want to take in any of the immigrants. And it led to an anti-immigration shock in the countries that took in lots of immigrants or were afraid they were going to have to. Um, so it was something like, um, I think it was 1.3 million people in just a few months showed up in Europe and got distributed. That was a big shock. Now that shock has disappeared and dissipated, but the political reaction in Northern European countries and especially Central and Eastern European countries has been viewed as an anti-globalization sort of phenomena or anti-EU phenomena, but I, I think that's fading and, and I think it's one off. The UK, for example, <clears throat> is, or at least their soon to be former prime minister was very anti-immigration and has been for years, creating a hostile environment when she was home secretary, drawing red lines when she became prime minister. Um, she is pro-globalization. She makes speeches saying how great trade is and how we have to support the WTO at the same time as being anti-immigration. But Brexit is continually wrapped up as part of the anti-globalization narrative. Now, the EU, during this time, signed a free trade agreement with Japan, a very large free trade agreement, finalized the trade agreement with Canada, pursued reform of the WTO quite significantly, but uh, is pursuing a number of things like e-commerce. The EU is not turning against globalization whatsoever, and what's going on in Europe is not anti-globalization, it's a bit of anti-migration and a bit of anti-EU that came in reaction to the migration. In Asia, TPP was supposed to die when Trump left, but it didn't. It got revived as CPTPP, and it was a little less pro-American than it was before. And it may spread now. So in Asia, you don't see anti-globalization spreading at all. RCEPT is still doing okay. India, well, you can tell me, but I, I think it's a country that is hesitant about globalization, but been doing very well by it. It has no plans to shut it down, as far as I, I can see, con control and things, but it's, it's working. But I'll, I'll I'll, you can tell me. In Africa and Latin America, I see basically no change whatsoever. 
There's always been a reluctance since they didn't get on the global value chain revolution, and so they're a little, little unha less happy about it. But I don't see any anti-immigration. But what you do see is occasional nationalistic moves against the disruption that has come with automation and globalization. And people put that in to uh, a, a narrative. So that's, I think the narrative needs to be deflated. Now let's get to Trump. I think one way of asking this is, is Trump a culmination or an aberration? So is Trump just the end of a series of problems and trends in the United States that found a particular symbolism? Or is it really just one guy who has strange ideas about trade? And I'm in the second camp. I believe that the particular form of anti-globalization that's in the United States right now in the government will not survive Trump. Uh, for a variety of reasons. First of all, let me go through a, a couple, three. You're, you're always supposed to have three, by the way, three points. Because it's, <laughs> it's the most you can actually remember as a speaker, hopefully, and usually you've forgotten the third one by you're done, so you have to make one up. It's definitely easier for people to remember what you're saying and write down, so three points. First of all, the GOP, the Republican Party, is the Free Trade Party. This is the party of George Bush Sr. and George Bush Jr. recently. George Bush Jr. didn't see any trade agreement he didn't like. And the same GOP senators and congressmen and special interest groups backing that are still there. Nothing really changed with the underlying political economy of it. And for a long time, they were, well, they made a few little noises when he started being protectionist to start with. But once he got him the tax cut through, everything was quieted down. And he, he's found a way to get a coalition for their main economic agenda, and so they all stayed quiet. But the worse he started getting on trade, the more they started getting a little bit uh, pushing back. And in particular, most recently, the Republican head of the, uh, Grassley insisted that Trump remove the steel and aluminum tariffs on Mexico and Canada before they would ratify the new NAFTA, which I call NAFTA. 0.8 because it's like NAFTA only a little worse. Now, um, they've also talked, some Republicans, about reducing his power to use national security uh, exceptions for anything or anything he wants. Um, the second is USMCA, as it's, as it's called now, is basically TPP with some strange rules in autos. So it was not, by any means, a change in the Republican Party line, which was the, the Obama's as well. TPP was, in essence, the way to renegotiate NAFTA because the US, Canada, and Mexico were in TPP. They updated all the rules that needed to be updated, and there was some negotiations. But basically, the refreshing of NAFTA that it obviously needed since it was passed in 94 was done by TPP. And what Leitziger did in the USMCA talks was take in most of the TPP things, not all of them, and then add on some strange things and rules of origin. They pushed for a bunch of other things that didn't get through, but in any case, it's not a radical change in, if you think of what he actually did, and he still hasn't got it passed. The last is industry does not back Trump on this new agenda. So partly because Trump is thinking about 20th century tariffs, but we live in the 21st century and as a consequence, when you need to import to export tariffs, especially tariffs that are hidden from consumers and therefore put on industrial inputs, is harming industry, not helping industry. The auto industry, the auto union, is not on board for this kind of protectionism. So I don't think, and, and they haven't really changed. They're just being a little, little so I, I don't think this is gonna survive. This kind of blunt protectionism will not outlast Trump. However, there is a subtlety with China. So there is absolutely no doubt that there's a groundswell of feeling in the United States that China is no longer the, like Japan or Germany, well, we just have to wait long enough and they'll do some strange things on trade and they'll get a car industry too, but then eventually they'll come just like us. Uh, I think there's a, a groundswell of feeling in the United States that that is not the case and that there may be some strategic rivalries going on. And that I don't think will go away. And in fact, Trump probably doesn't even really get that part. 
in the way he fought. If you wanted to fight China, you'd line up allies all around the world. The first thing he did was make everybody mad by putting steel tariffs on all the allies. China doesn't export steel anymore because it's all duties. And then they all retaliated, which made the US look like the bad guy. And then he kept going with these other things. So he's not doing it right, but I think that, that may go on. And in particular, I think the combination of 5G, privacy laws, military complex, uh, all those things will weave in to something that may lead to what looks like the new digital Cold War. And I think it's very interesting to see what the digital Cold War would look like because it seems to be happening in virtual space, but not real space. So one, one example I like, like to give is, you know, most of you have been in China and you're in China, it's pretty hard to order anything on eBay because you can't get to the website. But if somehow or another you got to the website and ordered something in China from eBay, it would get delivered, no problem. The protection is in virtual space, not real space. So maybe we will have a splinter net that breaks up, this completely fractures, but how far will that go down into the real world? I don't think we know, I think it's very difficult to know. And in particular, and this is bringing me on to my second part, I think we live in a world where there's two radically different rates of progress or processes. The first is the normal one we know, where trade agreements take a couple years. Uh, it takes two decades to double trade flows. Developing a new industry is a matter of a generation. There's another world which we live in where the ability to store, process, and transmit information doubles every 18 months, every two years, and things that were absolutely impossible just a couple years ago are absolutely ubiquitous. It went from science fiction to on your cell phone in about four years. Now, the trouble is those two processes cross paths in different things. And in, in the WTO, at the, I'm sorry, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, they started using the term 4.0 for everything. You know, Klaus did industry 4.0, and uh, it, that was very useful. And then next time it was globalization 4.0. And when I was there this, in, in, in January, people started saying government 4.0, education 4.0, uh, sports 4.0. And, well, I was like, what is this? You know, of course, everybody wants to use sexy buzzwords. It's Davos, after all. Um, it, but what I think it is, is it how does the digital revolution affect X? So education is a classic one. There are some parts of education which are being transformed at the explosive pace of digital technology. There's other parts which is still teachers sitting in a room with 20 people. And how that changes and how, is, is really something we're in the process of working out. So what I want to do now is go to sort of a way more out of the box thinking about protectionism and how it's coming. So, and this is where I'm going to start get, uh, standing up and walking around so you can't uh, focus too much on what I'm saying. Oh, and I don't know if they're going to, oh, is there a camera? Okay, good. It's a st steady camera, so I'll get out of the camera too. That's good. Um, now what I want to do is talk about what I'd like to call Globotics Upheaval, Globalization, Robotics, and the Future of Work, which is a title of my book, but I want to not, I'm not going to go through the book slides one by one. I want to use this to stimulate thinking. So the way I want you, want you to think about this is that we are on the cusp of the third great economic transformation in the modern history. The first took the workers from the farms to the factories. And the technological breakthrough there was mechanical power, steam power to start with. That power took the horse out of horsepower and put it into manpower. It in essence, oh, she liked that, she wrote that down, I like that. <laughs> I worked a long time on that sentence. So what it did was it really helped people who work with their hands and it only tangentially helped people who work with their heads. And as a consequence, at least from about 1870 onwards, it led to a great drop in inequality in the industrializing world. The second great transformation in my timing started in 1973 when the computer on a chip was patented. 
Now, we had computers before this, and some of you, some of the, the men in the audience I know of my generation, or at least using the same hairstyling as I do. And so that, that is, you remember when a computer was a stack of things with racks that you could put in. I remember my first PC, I wanted more memory, I pulled out a rack, stuck in a chip, and put it back in, and it worked. That's what computers were. Now that limit, that made them great for certain things, but it wasn't that great use in the factories because it was difficult. Now once you got a computer on a chip and you put that chip on a robot arm, you were in business. Anything that was a manual repetitive task could be automated and very soon was automated. Now what that did, that technology, let's just call it information and communication technology because it was all this together, it made better substitutes for people who work with their hands. But the same technology made better tools for people who work with their heads. But to make the tools work, you needed a university degree. So it created a huge skill twist from 1973 until now, where the technology itself undermined the productivity of, re of humans doing manual work, but upgraded the productivity of humans doing mental work. And it led to a great rise in inequality almost everywhere. Now, I believe this next transformation, which I'd like to call the globotics transformation, is a very different type of technology. Based on artificial intelligence and machine learning, it's essentially taking experience-based pattern recognition and turning it into data-based pattern recognition. And most of our jobs are based on experience-based pattern recognition. If you're a lawyer, a doctor, an economist, an architect, an engineer, if you're earning a lot of money, it's because you have a lot of experience and you sorted out the patterns over complex situations and know how to apply it to new ones. Brain power. This new technology, machine learning, is providing a substitute for that kind of know-how. For other types as well. It knows how to read and write and see and things like that. But the thing that's most startling is it's providing more substitutes for people with wisdom, judgment, and experience. Not wisdom, but judgment, experience. And more tools for average people. This technology does not require a university degree. In fact, we use it without even knowing we're using it. Voice recognition, when you talk to Siri or Alexis, that's AI. The advanced spell checking you see in Word now, that's AI. Optical character recognition, machine translation, handwriting recognition, that's all AI and it is dead easy to use. And therefore, replacing people with a certain skill set and giving more intelligence to average people. That's my speculation and that's how I want, want to sort of uh, take, take this through. Now what I'm gonna do is a couple of, uh, oops, this way. First of all, I want to say this, just so you know I'm making this all up, right? We are talking about the future. And when we talk about the future, that means you're making it up. But although the future is unknowable, it's also inevitable. And so what I want you to do is take my comments in the spirit that I'm trying to get you to think harder about the future because it's coming faster than most people think and in ways few expect. That's what I want to be telling you today and, and spin it out a little bit with the protectionism at the end. And the worst thing about the future is to pretend it's going to be like today. That is really, really bad idea, and, and particularly now. Hopefully at the end, you'll, if you needed that. So definitions. Globotics. Globalization plus robotics. Now, I've been uh, fortunate enough to have several reviews, very kind reviews of my book in the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal and uh, Science and a bunch of other places. And all of them went out of their way to say what an ugly word Globotics was. But actually, I was kind of happy about that because it's also a memorable word. Now, what I wanted to do was to remind you that digital technology, which is changing the world rapidly, is affecting globalization as well as automation. And you will, every single day in your news feeds, read about the amazing thing AI is doing with robots and artificial intelligence. But the same technology is changing globalization at the same pace. 
and I will argue that it's affecting the same jobs. And the fact that we've forgotten that globalization is also being driven by this path, I think is leading to a lot of misthinking and um, will come into protection. So when I talk about globalization, I'm mostly gonna talk about telemigration, um, which in a lot of audiences, I have to explain what I mean by all that, but this is India. So telemigration is you sit in one country, you work in another. And in India, they did first, they did the uh, business uh, out BPO, and then there's some direct with the IT and whatever, but that's gonna spread. That, and I think that's, that's uh, driven by digital technology. For robotics, I don't want you to think about robots that you see in the news all the time, arms that can do clever things, dog looking like robots that can open doors and things like that. Forget about that. In the, at least in the rich countries, almost nobody works in factories anymore, so that's not the important thing. People work in offices, and what matters is white collar robots. In other words, software that automate service sector jobs. So let me go through that a little bit. I won't go through this. There we go, okay. So this is one type of white collar robot, the low end of it. It's called robotic process automation and is exactly what you were talking about where Indian, pe people who used to do jobs in India for American companies uh, as offshoring are now being replaced by this kind of programming which does it and it moves a few jobs back to the United States and puts people out of work in, the, in, in Bangalore. So it's basically a, a, a macro if you know uh, how to write a macro in Word or Excel or something like that, it does that but on existing systems. So you, whatever somebody like has to open up an email and then change something in a database, change another thing like that, it does that automatically and much, much faster than, than humans. And it's, it's growing, uh, the, one of the bigger companies is Blue Prism. It went public a couple years ago. It's growing at 20, 30%. It's under the radar screens because it can be done at the department level with no major change in IT. So a lot of CEOs don't even know their company's doing it, but they're doing it because it saves cost. And also, um, in many industries, there's an explosion of data. And before, they just ignored the data. And now, with RPA, they can, can take account of it a little better. There's a high-end white-collar robots. This is called Amelia, uh, and there's, but there's other ones like Watson and many uh, these AI platforms. Amelia plays a big role in my book in the beginning, in the end, in the, in the, in the, in the, 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 the. So if I forget to tell you the story about Amelia and Amanda, rem remind me at the end. It's a great story. But anyways, this is done, this is the AI platform. It's software, but pretty soon you'll start calling it a her, I'm sure. Amelia was done by IPsoft, which was um, an Indian professor at NYU named Doob who did it. And... Um, what they do, what th these platforms do, is in addition to the usual voice recognition and all that, they have capacities to look for patterns in data and you can train them for different sort of things. So if, like if you want somebody to look for fraud in the trucking department or you wanna look for inconsistencies in real estate contracts that you've signed in 100 different cities uh, over the last 10 years, this thing can do it for you. Um, so it's replacing higher end workers, not the lower end workers. And these two are coming together, so that, that's the, the trend. So by this time, those of you who've been paying attention will probably say, nothing new. Old wine, new bottles. He's given a few fancy words to things we know to sell a few books. And yeah, I would like to sell a few books. Um, and, and I was reluctant at first to follow through with this book because I worried about maybe this time isn't different. But I did convince myself, in the next few slides, I want to convince you that the digital transformation, the globotics transformation, is different, and you really have to treat it differently, think differently about it. So here we go. First of all, it's affecting service and professional jobs, not just factory jobs. So these people have never experienced globalization or automation. They were shielded from globalization by the fact that services, or most of them, were non-traded. They were non-traded for technical reasons. Many services, you have to get the buyer and the supplier in the same room at the same time, and that was difficult to do for technical reasons. And they were shielded from automation because computers couldn't think, or at least not very much. So any job that required somebody to read, for example, 
or answer the phone and, and, and understand what they're saying. That required a real human being. Now, that's changing. These people, on the other hand, know all about robots in China. They've been competing for 25 years, and things aren't going well. So if you tell them there's a globotics revolution coming along, they go, what's new? But this matters that these are service and professional types. First of all, it's lots of people. In the, uh, and this uh, focus right now, I'm going to focus on the rich countries, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and weave in the, the um, emerging markets as well. So this is for the U.S. U.S. has uh, 140 million jobs, of which only 9 million are in production, and 6 million are in construction and extraction. And almost everything we read about AI and robotics is about those 15 million jobs. But Amelia and the telemigrants are a threat to these jobs, the 100 million, more than 100 million jobs. So there's a lot of them. On the good side, they're more flexible and easier to re-employ. So one of the great tragedies of the old globalization was you'd have in the north of England or uh, north of France, you'd have a factory close and 50-year-old people who've never done anything else in their life had no job, no prospect really of retraining, and they lived in a place where there were no jobs and they couldn't sell their house and move to a place where there were jobs because it was too expensive. That's not how this one's going to happen. It's going to happen like journalists in London. So journalists in London 10 years, 15 years ago, journalism was a good career. Most of the journalists worked for papers. They had a career path. They had a pension plan. They had benefits. They were respected, reasonably well paid, and they had a permanent, relatively permanent contract. Now, very few of those people have permanent jobs anymore, but they're not unemployed. They've reinvented themselves as freelance copy editors or bloggers or vloggers or uh, whatever. They have jobs, but their jobs are paid less and they're precarious. They're uncertain. So they have reacted to the technological shock, not by becoming technologically unemployed, but by being downgraded in the labor market in terms of salary, which we can measure, but in terms of precarity, which we don't. And I would, one of the things I'd like to suggest is that we develop a new version of unemployment that doesn't look at number of hours, but looks at the uncertainty of the contracts involved. Because for the humans, the uncertainty is absolutely as important as the, the average salary. The other thing is they're not ready for it, as I said. They've never heard about it before. Number two, Digitech is ICT, but. So when I first started doing the research for this book, I wanted to catch up on what new had happened in ICT, and I couldn't find ICT anymore. It's all become digital technology. Everything's talking about digital technology, not ITC. So I wondered, is this the same thing? Is this, you know, old wine, new bottles? And the answer is yes, it's exactly the same thing. But I think it deserves a new moniker, a new label, because it's acting differently. And this is how I th think about it. First of all, ICT was mostly applied to manufacturing, uh, at least for the concerns of the things I'm talking about. But manufacturing is mostly physical, with a little bit of information and a little bit of communication. And that little bit transformed, allowed offshoring and all sorts of things. So it was transformational, but still manufacturing is a physical thing. Digitech is being applied to services, which is mostly information and communication, and only a little bit of physical. And what that means is that a different physics applies. The physics of the last globalization was constrained by the laws of matter. The law, the globalization going forward is not. It's going to be constrained by the laws of electrons. And those are very different laws of physics. Just to give you one very concrete example, imagine how long it would take to double the world flows of exports and imports. Now the answer, if things happened really well, would be at least two decades. Because you have to build twice as many ships. You have to expand the capacity to the ports. You'd have to build factories. You'd have to develop new products. It takes time because of the physical constraints involved of moving matter around. Now, if you look at the data flows, international data flows, those have doubled every two years for the last 10 years and probably will double for every two years going forward. So you're looking at a world 
were the constraints that we economists have taken as background to what we need to do, which is stuff happens slowly, into a world where those constraints no longer apply. Now, there's other things slowing it down, but it's really, really different this time because it's not slowed down because it's not physical. Number three, AI, today's AI is different. So AI, as you, many of you will know, was invented, or the, the term was invented in 1954, and it's had its ups and downs, and it was good and bad. And I want to argue that this time is really different. So in 2019, computers can read, write, see, speak, understand speech, create visual outputs, recognize subtle patterns. Even some of them can speak as quickly as I can. Uh, well, look, this is the way we're going to do it. Okay. When I tell a joke, I'll be talking, and then I'll stop, and I'll look like this, and then you're supposed to laugh. Okay? Should we practice? Okay. Not all jokes work, you know. So anyways, in 2015, computers couldn't do that. So what changed? The programming is different. Or at least that's what I would claim. And the way I want you to think about this is this famous book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, by Daniel Kahneman, uh, a psychologist. And he uh, was pointing out something that psychologists have known for a long time, is that humans have two very different ways of thinking. The psychologists call it system one and system two. He called it thinking slow and thinking fast. Now, thinking slow is like when you're trying to do your taxes by hand and adding up the sums. That's slow, it's effortful, it's logical, but above all, you know how you do it. It's a process. And therefore, a computer programmer could turn what you're doing into a complete set of instructions for the computer to do in every logical situation. That's called a computer program. Now, you could only write computer programs for stuff where we know how we think. Now, thinking fast is a very different type of thinking. Let's suppose you're on your cell phone and walking down the stairs and you recognize that this is actually a cat at the same time you stumble. Now, your brain, in a flash of a second, will know that you stumbled, send out the corrections you need to all the muscles to catch you before you fall, and recognize a cat, and you may also remember that it's your wife's birthday at the same time. <laughs> and you don't know how you did that. It wasn't effortful. It was unconscious. And you can do many things at the same time. But since you don't know how you did any of those things, you could not teach a computer to do them. Now, what we do is we program, comp not we, but the, the AI geniuses have started programming computers in a very different way for some things called machine learning. Now, what machine learning does is take a very large structured data set. And a structured data set is where the question is clear and the outcome is clear. Now, if you can get a few million instances of almost anything where the question is clear and the outcome is clear, the AI geniuses can estimate a program to make guesses on that. So the way they do it is they start with a more or less a blank statistical model. It has different names like deep learning or neural networks. There's many different names for it. But they're basically, for, for those of you who are economists, it's essentially a great big uh, over-determined model. So there's more parameters than there are the problems. And then they start passing it back and forth to get a better guess. They're essentially data mining. And once they get it good enough, they may try it with other data and stuff like that. But in the end, they have a statistical model, which in the end is a computer program. You, you put input here, it goes through a set of instructions, and it makes a guess. But it's an extremely complicated code, so complicated and nonlinear that even the AI geniuses who did it don't know how it's doing that. So, for example, it can recognize face, faces very, very well, but you can't ask, what was it in your face that it knew was it recognized? It's not run done that way. It's just making guesses, just like us, in our thinking fast way. So the point here is it's different because this change in the way we program computer gave computers a whole set of cognitive capacities that they did not have before 2016. And many of those cognitive capacities are useful in the workplace. And in particular, lots of them are gateway skills. So there was many human jobs that were given to humans 
because, for example, computers couldn't read, couldn't open emails, they couldn't read handwriting, they couldn't recognize photos. You know, it, 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 all these jobs had one task that only a human could do, and then the whole job was done by a human. These gateway skills are allowing computers to automate many, many tasks because they take out that one little human element. So that's why I think it's entirely different, and we're only at the very beginning. This really started going in 2016. You, you know, it's, a, it's an exponential curve, but you can date it wherever you want. But Forbes and Fortune called 2016 the year of AI. So that's where I started. Number four, robotics is advancing at an explosive pace. Past transformations were much slower. And one of the themes I would like you to get away is if you're thinking about the future by using the recent past, you're making mistakes. Of course, you have to think about the recent past. That's all we have. But projecting forward is a serious mistake because this is changing way faster than it did before. So let me go through this uh, illustration of how things have changed in a, such a crazy way. So this is the moon landing, Apollo 11 in, two th in 1969 was an amazing thing. Apollo 11, um, so let me just take my jacket off. This is really hot topic. Gosh, you guys love all my jokes. Okay. Um, Apollo 11 was guided to the moon and back by one of the most powerful computers on Earth at the time, a huge mainframe computer. That was amazing at the time. I don't know how many of you uh, actually were alive when that happened or were cognizant when it happened. It was just an astounding thing that they could send somebody to the moon and back. Many people still don't believe it in Arizona. Now, <laughs> this is iPhone 6S, and it's also a powerful computer. Do you know how much more processing speed this computer has than the one that guided Apollo 11 to the moon and back? 120 million times more. That's amazing, right? Now, you want to know what's even more amazing? This is the iPhone 10, which came out in 2017. And it has more power than the iPhone 6S. Do you know how much more? Twice. Now, what that means is there was more progress in processing speed between 2015 and 2017 than there was between 1969 and 2015. So if you're thinking the future will be a little bit like the past, but only more so, you've forgotten the logic of the exponential curve, or it's actually 2 to the power of n. So the second is it's coming faster than most believe. It's predictable but unexpected. We even have a name for this. It's called digital disruption. And I think this is, this is how I explain to myself why people don't anticipate it. And I think it's a caution to myself and to others to to realize that we have a severe cognitive impairment when it comes to thinking about stuff like this. Now, when trying to convince myself or explain it to myself why I believed it's true, I constructed this little diagram which I'd like to share with you in the next couple of slides. First one is this. So think about the world as having progress on the vertical axis and years on the horizontal axis. And I'm just gonna assert that humans think instinctively about progress as a straight line. Now, what I mean by straight line is that if you think about some sort of technological advance that's going to come in two or three years, you read it in the newspaper and you go, is it likely to happen that, for example, um, Uber cabs in London will drive themselves? You can't help but look at what had happened the last two or three years and judge on that. Because actually, the future is so complicated, you can't actually sit down with a spreadsheet and work it out thinking slow. You have to use thinking fast gut instincts. And the gut says the next two or three years will be a lot like the last two or three years, and that's straight line thinking. If you're using the increments of the recent past to evaluate increments in the recent future, you're straight lining the future. So let me just take that as given. But that's not how digital technology works. Digital technology follows an exponential curve in the beginning. Eventually, it hits some sort of diminishing returns, and so it turns into a lazy S-curve. But for a long time, it's this explosive where everything doubles every two years. And that's definitely where we are now. 
Now, if you think hard about that, that has important implications. It means, first, our gut overestimates the impact of technology. That's why it's so easy to be alarmist or to be viewed as alarmist. Because, you see, I see a few things happening now, and I go, oh, my goodness, it's going to be incredible. So people, in the beginning, think it's going to go faster than it actually is. It, by the way, this is a constant growth rate. It's just on a very, very low base. But once that base gets big enough, the increments turn absolutely amazing, like, like the iPhone I showed you. And that means that our gut underestimates the impact eventually. And this is what I call the holy cow moment. This is when people go, people like the CEO of J. Crew goes, what happened? Marketing went online. Like, what, you weren't paying attention? <laughs> of course he knew marketing was going online. He just didn't expect it to come so fast. Now, this in technology is called Amara's Law. It's actually well known, or at least it's well discussed, that we tend to overestimate technology in the beginning, underestimate, there's a number of names for it, the hype curve and all that sort of stuff. In economics, we call it the Dornbusch Law of Crises. The Dornbusch, how many know the Dornbusch Law of Crises? Yeah, so crises take longer to come than you ever would have thought, but when they come, they come faster than you ever would have thought ex possible. And that's this. You go, like, oh, it's going to be a crisis, going to be, no, no crisis, no crisis, and then, boom, banking systems down, financial systems down, uh, exchange rate goes, run on the central bank. It all happens all at once because it is actually growing at the same pace. Okay. Now, I also want to, I'm going to stop here because I think we'll have lots of good questions. I'm going to stop very quickly, very soon. Promises, promises. Okay. So, first of all, think tasks, not occupations. Many jobs will go, but few occupations. I think there's a systematic bias to think of artificial intelligence as baby humans, or maybe like humans in elementary school, just give them a few more years and they'll be real humans and do everything we can do. And I think that's just dead wrong. I think you ought to think about AI and telemigrants as tractors. They're very good at things and they change the profession of farming and they made it mean we needed fewer farmers, but they did not eliminate the profession of farming because tractors didn't grow up to become farmers. And the same thing is true about AI. AI is very limited right now, very specific. It can do some amazing things, but it's not going to become a human anytime soon, or at least according to the scientists. This is how I think the globotics transformation will come. This, this one, I don't even have to pause when people laugh, because it's like so real. Um, I mean, the thing is, this, these things have changed our lives, changed our societies. They changed our work relationships. They changed our family relationships. They changed the way we interact physically with the cities we live in. They have completely changed the way we react with knowledge globally. But here's the thing. Nobody decided to let that happen. There was nobody in 2008 who sat down and wrote, OK, we know iPhones are definitely going to disrupt our lives. Let's set some rules for it, you know, family rules, workplace rules, social rules. Nobody. The reason is it was involving billions of uncoordinated, seemingly small decisions. You started putting one thing on, then your newspaper, and then you got Google Maps, and then you started looking for restaurants with Yelp, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how the globotics transformation will come. Machine learning trained white collar robots will take one task at a time, replace one worker at a time. Telemigrants will place one task at a time. But it'll look like twists and turns. People won't even see that it's a trend until five or six years down the road we go, man, how did we ever get along without them? Just like with the phones. And that's why I think people are expecting globotics to come the way the old globalization did. Factory closures, backlash, protests. That's not the way this is going to happen. This is going to come like the iPhone infiltration, and most people won't even realize it's happening. This is for the rich countries. OK, so I'm going to skip this part and just go to telemigration. So this is how countries like India are, I mean, India is already doing this, but I think it will expand. 
So this is how I want you to think about telemigration. So telemigration is people sitting in one country working in offices in others. So it's a, a little bit like a lot of a reverse of the stuff that's been going on in India for a long time. They don't send you their receipts and you put them in the thing and send it back the next day. This is somebody online working. And it's only one type of trade and services, but generally speaking, they're increasing. So the way I want you to think about this is I want you to think about globalization as arbitrage. What I mean by that is when things cost different amounts in different countries, somebody exploits those differences by making it here and selling it there. And for a long time, the only real way to do that was through goods. So if you had an advantage, whether it was you had coal or you had labor or you had whatever, the only way you could really exploit that comparative advantage was by making a good and sending the good across the border. The reason was that there was technological barriers to trade and services. And digital technology is breaking down those barriers. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Just basically, they're making remote people less remote. And that will open up trade and services. Now, come back to the trade and arbitrage. The largest price differences in the world, I would assert, are the price of professional services or semi-professional services. So my job, for instance, is paid about 30 times what the same guy doing the same thing I'm doing in Manila. I sit in Geneva, he sits in Manila, I make at least 20 times or 30 times what he or she does, and he or she may have exactly the same degree as I do. And um, the reason my institute hasn't arbitraged on us yet is technological. Not, not because there's a philosophical barrier to it, there's no law against it, it's just technological. So the wage gap is going to make this profitable. And when I think this is the wave of globalization going forward, it's because these wage gaps are so large that they will drive this forward. It w won't happen immediately. Or another analogy, think about we had free trade potentially, technologically, in services, but there was a 1,000% tariff. There would be no trade in services. But digital technology lowers that to 500% in two years, and 125 in another two years, et cetera. So given how large those barriers are, there's going to be an enormous incentive to globalize services. Domestic telecommuting in rich countries is paving the way. So the rich country companies and workers are getting used to having remote workers in their teams. The companies are going to projects and matrix organizations. They're using cloud-based collaborative software to keep the team going together. They're allowing flexible schedules and getting managers to understand how different people work. Now that's opening the door to international telecommuting. And it's big in the US and it will go fast, I think. Online freelancing platforms like Upwork, Amazon, Mechanical Turk, Fiverr, there's a whole bunch of these things. These are the way people are gonna find each other, or at least uh, at, the, at the retail level. So it's like eBay. Uh, if you want somebody to do a service, like uh, copy editing in French, uh, you just go on Upwork, you put a request, and you will get 50 people willing to do that. They'll tell you how much they wanna pay. You can hire them, pay them, and manage them on Upwork seamlessly. There's tens of millions of workers registered on Upwork in over a hundred countries, and there's a Chinese version of it coming out. So these are, in essence, the container ship that's going to facilitate this kind of stuff, or at least part of it. Advanced telecoms, we've all seen that. People are less remote than they were before. And machine translation. So this is, again, affects India. One of India's great advantages in the service sector is English. And uh, machine translation has gotten very good very quickly. It's still a long way from perfect. But as most of you know, if you do business with people who don't speak in native English, it's not perfect English anyways, but you still get along with it because either you need them or they're, or they're useful. So Google Translate, Skype Translator, YouTube Auto Translate Captions, Microsoft Translators, this stuff is being built into our software and we're not, they're not really telling us about it, but if you try the options, it starts being very, very good. And what this means, I think, is that there's gonna be a global talent tsunami. In some sense, the 1990s was dominated by the fact that hundreds of millions of factory workers joined the world market for man manual work. And it transformed a lot of things. 
I think the 2020s will be the same thing in services. With Digitech, telecoms, and above all machine translation, I think hundreds of millions of talented, low-cost foreigners are going to join the service market and start to compete for jobs in, in the rich countries. And I think it, will, it won't be just the high-end jobs, it'll be basically all the jobs. So I'm gonna stop right there, and, and uh, if I can speculate for a few minutes on, two minutes on, the, on what it means for the Global South and India in particular. So I wrote this book for the rich countries because I was, I'm really worried that they're not prepared. And the second word in the title is upheaval. And I honestly believe that there may be an upheaval uh, as the white collar workers displaced by Globots join the blue collar workers displaced by China and robots and, and we may have an upheaval. There's even a US presidential candidate called Andrew Yang who's talking about the globotics transformation. He doesn't know he's talking about the globotics transformation. He's never met me. But he's talking about offshoring of service jobs and automation of service jobs, not manufacturing, service. And he says that that is gonna cause a revolution. Uh, now he won't get elected but that narrative will be very attractive to any left-leaning Democrat and probably catch on in Europe as well. Because it's a way of blaming somebody for this dis-ease that's not China and it's not immigrants. It's technology. In particular, big tech companies who we're all getting ready to hate anyways. So I think that narrative, the backlash against tech that causing all sorts of disruptions will spread and could lead to backlashes. That's essentially where I was gonna go with the new protectionism. I think the backlash in the North to the globotics transformation will bring up protection and protectionism of a variety of ways, and we can talk about uh, where it is possible, where it's not, but probably the most obvious is regulation. Certain types of regulation will prevent offshoring of jobs uh, for political reasons, protectionist reasons, but that's probably how, how they'll go about it. 